Welcome to the Black Entrepreneur Experience Podcast, inside the business, buzz, and brilliance of Black entrepreneurs. Here is your host, Dr. Francis Richards. Thank you for joining us for a Black Entrepreneur Experience. This is where we shine the light on the most successful Black entrepreneurs in the world. I'm your host, Dr. Francis Richards. Clarity, inspiration, and results are the three words that will best describe our guests. We're so excited to have David Young, owner of JSY Coaching and Consulting Company that is dedicated to empowering people. Welcome, David. Hi, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. You know what? I've given our audience a snippet of your bio. Can you fill in the gaps and share with our audience about you and your company? Sure. Well, who I am and what I do, I work as a performance coach. I'm also a speaker and a seminar leader. And what I do is I go in and I help make the difference for people. What my specialty is, is in a context specialist. And so what that means is that most people, most consultants primarily focus on content. That's like the what of the problem, like what's missing, what do they need to do? How do we improve the supply chain? How do I help my daughter's grades improve? That's kind of like the what of the conversation. A context specialist is focuses on how are you talking about the content? Meaning, are you talking about this content from a place of scarcity? Are you talking about the content from a place of, I can't do this? And for most people, the context is in the background and it usually drives the situation. And so for me, what I'm committed to is having people have their lives and businesses really work and also really inspire them and have them being fulfilled in their life. My background, actually, I was a pastor before I got into this work. So what I did is I spoke on Sundays and I did counseling for couples who are under 30 years old. And uh, that was just like an amazing and aliving experience. And it was funny that I got into ministry because before that, I was on course to work for the Defense Department. I had a background living in China for three years, studying Chinese language and focusing on intelligence analysis. But when I came back to the States, I felt this calling to ministry and really being with people. And the confronting thing was, is that I had an opportunity to go ahead and move over to the East Coast and work for the government. And I was confronted with was that I was already doing something that I loved. And what I loved was being with people and having them really get how valuable they are and having them really create in their lives. And so I made a choice to stay in ministry. And uh, from ministry, I got into coaching as just a part of my own training. I wanted to find out what is really going to make the difference for people and what they're doing in their lives. And I didn't want to continue doing ministry as something that I was being paid for. I really wanted it to be a ministry in my life. And so um, I'm still very involved with my church community, but what I do now for work uh, during the day is coaching and consulting. And so I love being able to do that on a day-to-day basis. And yeah, it lights me up. David, how did you decide this was the business for you? And what was that aha moment that you knew it was going to be successful? The moment that I knew it was going to be successful was after finishing my first live seminar. It was a nine-hour seminar called Take Your Life On. And I think it was the first time we did it in New Hampshire. And when we did the seminar, there was a woman who had stood up in the middle of the seminar. And and the seminar looks like live coaching. So when she came up, she was on her second marriage, was confronted with her weight, had a business that was dying and taking her down with her. And she felt she was unable to spend time with her kids. And by the end of that live coaching session, she discovered that who she was in her life was angry, angry and bitter at things. And what she discovers that she had the possibility of being happy in her life and her life working and really getting that laughter was just missing from her life. And so she began to focus on smiling more in her life and getting help where she needed it. And so we're up there and there are three parts that I remember well. One was um, she said, I'm committed to making my business work and having my finances work in my life. And I said, okay, got it. So what are you going to do about that? And she said, I'm going to talk to a financial advisor and I'm going to go ahead and ask for help on this because I've always been afraid of asking for help. And so I said, okay, great. When are you going to do that? She said, when I get back home. And I said, when would now be a good time to do that? And what walked up to the microphone, she said, can anybody help me with my finances? And then there was a person in the audience that I'm a financial advisor. I'd be happy to help you. No problem. And then there was another moment where I said, what's the next thing that's there for you to do? And she said, I want to go home and hug my kids because I haven't sincerely hugged them. And I don't remember how long because I've been so stressed out. And after that moment, you know, that was a, like a moment in the seminar. But when it was done, there was this experience that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to be with people and have their businesses and their life work. Yeah, I think that was the moment for me. 
standing there in that seminar, having that woman share. And then after it was finished, just sitting down and feeling on fire with what's possible for people in their lives. That's amazing. David, how do you define success? What does that look like for you? And how long did it take to manifest in your life? I think for me, success is being able to live life authentically. I think a lot of people do have rules for success that really debilitate them. And so they live their life for the majority in failure. And success is something they taste maybe towards the end of their life, or they're always behind the pole of success. And once they get there, the pole moves ahead of them. So for me, success is knowing that I'm living my life with integrity and knowing that I'm living my life with authenticity. And for me, that really looked like that I was living my life, spending my time doing what I love doing which is being able to empower people and make a difference for their business or for their life. And also that I would be able to spend time with my family. I knew there are three components that I wanted to have present in my life. I wanted to have the freedom of money, but also freedom of time. I didn't want to be working all the time and not being able to spend time with my kids or with my wife. And so for me, success looked like actually doing things that were scary and courageous to have my life look like that. So it meant starting a business and then getting the training, getting certified, learning how to coach. And it meant altering my schedule so that I actually spend a good time of the week with my family and that I can say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to take my son camping for three days. And that's what we're going to be doing. Or sorry, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to be with my wife for the next two days. And that's what I'm focusing on. So for me, it was really making courageous decisions and doing things that maybe don't look like a traditional American nine to five job, or even what looks like a a traditional entrepreneur's job where you're always on the grind all the time. And to say, no, this is what my priorities are in my life. It's God, my wife, my family, and my business and my work. And my time should reflect that. I want my time to be looking like I spend it with God, with my wife and my family. And then on my business, which really gives me life. So for me, success is being able to have my time and my actions reflect my priorities authentically in life. Very well said. What is a daily or weekly habit that you do consistently that has given you the greatest success? Meditation and early rising, definitely. Uh, I think rising early has changed. There was a time when early rising was 4 a.m. for me. Another time it was 6 a.m. But the point is just like, whatever I do, I get to choose how I'm going to be in my state when I start my day. I never want to have like a default state when I start my day. So no matter what happens, I know that if I wake up and I go through a morning routine, before anything else happens, regardless of what happened the night before or regardless of what's going to happen during the day, I know that I'm going to be at my peak starting off. And that's made all the difference so that I get to choose how I'm going to be during the day. And so that usually looks like waking up and taking time to meditate, to move my body, exercise in some way, to learn something, and then to spend some time focusing on my spiritual growth or development. And David, what is one valuable lesson you wish you knew before starting your business? One valuable lesson, definitely getting a team and asking for help. I think as like a, as an entrepreneur, there's a sense of the freedom and independence, but I really realizing nobody succeeds on their own, that there are people who actually are invested in your growth, invested in your happiness, and people who want to help you. And when you're starting your business or starting out as an entrepreneur, that's going to be the time that people actually do help you. When you're growing and you're financially successful, actually, you're going to be helping other people and people in your life who may have wanted to contribute to you, maybe can't contribute to you in as big of a way as I would have been able to early on. So I think a viable lesson has been ask for help from people who really want to help you, who really want to be with you and really want to support you because they're out there. And what would you say, David, is working well for you now in your business? Inviting team into my life. I was doing a lot of the coaching and consulting on my own, but now our team has grown. And it's been really exciting to work with that and my team. And so that's really working well now for me in my business. And also um, involving my family and what I do has really been working for me. I don't know a lot of times say not to mix your, your family with your business, but for me, it's really been sharing my mission in the world with the people in my life that I care about. And that's really been working well for me to be able to share that with them and to work together with them on that. And you had alluded to, David, getting a team, building a team. Share with the audience what that looks like or how to do that. You know, you hear a lot of individuals are solo entrepreneurs and Do you have any tips or strategies in reference to building that team? Yeah, definitely. I mean, now there's like, you have people who work on the back end of things, like with an accountant or with a bookkeeper. I also have people who work with me during my seminars and a group of people that I'll work with. if I'm going to be coaching a particularly large organization. But for me, before I got to a place where I was able to grow my team, I just asked for people who were interested in what I was doing and were willing to work with me. 
And um, I, at the time, I didn't have money to pay them. And I said, this is what I'm committed to. This is what I'd like to do. And what I would do is I would sit down with them at least once a week or once a month, and we would get coffee. And I would just share what I'm doing, and they would give me advice or support me. Or they'd say, hey, I can help out with this. It was just inviting other people into the conversation. So my suggestion would be finding the people who want to support you, or people who are involved, or maybe can even partner with you, and share what you're doing with them. Share your vision with them, and then hear what theirs is and find out where you can intersect the two of them and work together on them. And who would you say are your top influencers in your life and what lessons did they teach you? Oh, man. Top two influencers in my life, probably Bruce Lee. I'm half Chinese and I always looked up to Bruce Lee. If I ever had to say I had a hero, it would be Bruce Lee. And it was just being able to come into an industry where it was a predominantly, the film industry is a predominantly white industry and there wasn't really a place for Asian actors outside of their stereotypical role. And he really just blew the lid off of that. And the sense of dynamicism, And if there is no way, I'm going to make one. That really influenced me. If there's something or an expression in the world that I want to create or have and I can't find an opportunity or a way to make that work, then I just create the opportunity. So I love Bruce Lee's quote. He always say, uh, to hell with circumstances, I create opportunities. Let's see, if I had to pick another influencer in my life, I think it'd be my dad. My dad would always say, pray more than you think. I always appreciate that about him. He always reminded me that I'm not just trying to make money, but... Your life is meant to be a contribution to the world. He would say something interesting. He'd always say, we weren't his children. He'd say, you're God's children and we're just taking care of you. And so who you are is for the world. And the world needs a contribution. And you want to find out what that contribution is and make it. And he always say, stop thinking too much. You should pray more than you think. Really, Really leading me to be guided more by my intuition and by my heart. And let my intellect serve that intuition instead of the other way around. Beautiful advice. David, talk to a younger you. What advice would you give to a younger David? Everything's going to be okay. Don't worry so much. I think I used to worry all the time, especially when I was first starting out. I had a, you know, I remember when we were first starting out in our business, I was, we were, we'd have been married for about four years. I remember living in my parents' basement. My son was 10 months old and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to pay for the bills. I don't know how I'm going to make this work. Am I being an irresponsible dad, an irresponsible father? And it was just this kind of crushing debilitating stress and anxiety about, am I doing the right things? It's going to work. But at the same time, also knowing that this is really what my heart wants to do. And I'm asking for help and asking for advice and getting mentors and they're saying, go for it. But at the same time, I was just unsure of myself. And so if I had to give advice to my younger self, it would be to breathe, to don't worry, listen to God or your creator, to your heart, whatever you want to call that and keep moving forward. Just keep making steps forward. You talked about this a little bit at the beginning of the interview. I want you to expound on how do you blend your personal life, family life with your business? Yeah. People always talk about how do you have like work-life balance. And to be honest, I think that's a load of BS. I don't think you're going to have a work-life balance. But for me, I share my work. You know, it's my mission in the world with my family. And so it's like my, my, my wife knows everything that I'm doing in the world. And when I get to travel on a trip, I always invite my son to come with me if I can have him come with me and you know, just bring him in, in line with what I'm doing in the world, what, like, what, what the contribution that we want to make in the world. And so I feel it's really more about alignment and less about balance, honestly, having that be aligned and also prioritizing, really being clear that the blessing that I receive through my business and through my work comes from my marriage and it comes from my kids first. And so I know that by investing into my relationship and by investing into my kids, that's what fuels me to be able to go out there and lead on stage or to be there with that client when they're not there. It's not the other way around. My business doesn't give me the energy to be with my family. It's the other way around. So I treat my family as the source of my energy and who I am in life. And I want to have them aligned with what I'm doing in the world. I like that. David, what is a technology tool or technology platform that is a must-have for you to manage your business? Oh, man, there's so many. (laughs) I love technology. A few things. I use FreshBooks for most of my accounting. I love that. I use Zoom for a lot of the calls that I do. Evernote is a huge thing. I love Evernote, and I'm a big fan of Google Drive, actually. Um, it's really great just for collaborating, being able to collaborate on documents together, being able to work on documents together. I love that. So I think those are just a few that I love deeply. Okay. And let's talk about risk or failure. What is the worst moment in business and what was the takeaway? 
Oh man, I remember there was a time when I was, uh, most of the seminars that I do, I'm invited to come and speak. And there was a time in my business where I decided that I was going to go ahead and and host a seminar myself. And there's a big difference between being invited to speak for a community or for an organization and then you hosting a seminar for the public. So I, I reserved this huge space at a hotel. We we're going to do that. And I was running around here and there coaching clients, making sales, doing more work. I realized I didn't have the time to actually promote the seminar that I was going to do for the public because in the past, I didn't have to do any promotion. I would just kind of arrive and we would start. And so in the end, we weren't going to hit the quota that we wanted to meet for the seminar to actually launch. And I'm kind of freaking out. Like, what am I doing? I already paid down the down payment for this thing. I've passed the deadline where I can go ahead and say no, that we're not going to do this. And so I ended up having to, to pay this huge fee for the entire rental space, but didn't have enough people register for the seminar. And I really got like the lesson that I learned from that is you got to make sure you're planning. And if you're going to branch out from what you've normally been doing, you really want to be able to look at that. And so my previous model had been, you know, I do seminars specifically for an organization or specifically for a community and not for the general public. And I think if you want to branch out into something new, just because it's exciting, you really want to evaluate that first and get another pair of eyes on that. I think I had a professor who told me that if it's a really good meal, it'll still look like a good meal even when it's cold. So you don't want to just rush into it when it's hot and ready to go. So I think that was one of the worst moments in my business. And the takeaway was really to stick to what you've been doing if it's working well. And when you decide to branch out, do that really intentionally and not in a haphazard way. You know, here on Black Entrepreneur Experience, what we do is we shine the light on the most successful Black entrepreneurs. We also, one of our missions is about recycling dollars into our community. And we also want to inspire and ignite more individuals in the community to become entrepreneurs. Talk to the person in our audience. They want to start a business, but they're fearful. What advice, David, would you offer them? I would say go out and find the people who've already done what you want to do and let them pour into you. And if you can't find real people, then find people online and read their stories so that you're putting more inspiration that outweighs the fear in your life. Because most of the fear, it comes from doing something we don't know how to do. And that's how everything is in life. Before you do something, of course, you don't know how to do it. I think for me starting out, it was listening to interviews of other black entrepreneurs, listening to people who are successful in doing what I wanted to do and hearing how they do it, and then just taking action on that. And I would spend sometimes hours just listening to seminars, listening to videos, listening to audio casts until that's all I was thinking about. And it really just changed my thinking because I think that going from a work mindset to an entrepreneurial mindset is a huge shift and you got to change the conversation that's in your head and you can't change the conversation that's in your head unless you bring in another speaker. So I would say listen to audio programs and put as much different conversation in your head so that you can outweigh the old one that's there and then take action. Excellent advice. David, what book would you recommend and why? Oh, Getting Things Done by David Allen. I think for any solo entrepreneur, you're doing everything. You're wearing 17 hats and you still got to get up and perform. And so I think for David Allen, getting things done was like the Bible of productivity for me. He goes from not just how to get things done, but how to live in a state of stress-free productivity. And for me, that was just amazing. It's just a method of, he was, David Allen always says that your mind is for having ideas, not for storing them or holding on to them. And I think for most of us entrepreneurs, you have like a million things buzzing around your head. But when you're just trying to remember things of what you need to do and that you don't have a system to manage your thoughts and your tasks and your projects that are going on, it can be overwhelming. So getting things done by David Allen was a game changer for me. And I totally recommend that for anybody. Okay. And if you conducted this interview, what is the one question that you would have asked yourself and I want you to answer that question. Yeah. I guess the question I want to ask myself is, why are you doing all of this? Like, what's your end game? For me, the answer to that question is that I really believe there's a, there's a conversation in the world that peace is not possible. Like, if you ask the average person, if you say, is world peace possible? They'd probably say no. And it's, there's always going to be conflict or the world is not going to work for everyone. And that's just how it's going to be. And I find it odd that that's the average conversation in the world. And I, and I would love to be able to shift that. And I think the majority of our problems in the world are created by people. And I don't think they're going to be solved by anything else except people. And so being able to unlock people and empower people 
I think solves will end up solving a lot of problems in the world. And I think we're at a time in history where things are moving so fast and it's possible for terrible things to happen to people in a huge way, but it's also possible for people to come together and work in ways that they've never been able to connect before never been able to work together before and really make a difference in the, and all the kind of issues that are going on in the world, but also in our community. So for me, I wanted to be able to do my part, I think, in that and be able to use whatever God has given me to do my part in that play. I want to be able to like look at my kids and not just hope that they have a great life, but I would love for them to be able to look at me and say, that's what a great life looks like. And I want to show them how to live. And, you know, when I, when that time comes, I also want to show them a graceful and meaningful way to, to die and to pass on. David, can you share with our audience a parting piece of advice you want to offer? Yeah, I think the parting piece of advice would be every day, take a moment for yourself to be in silence and then to recognize that you can't steer a parked car. So you got to take action. You got to be moving. So take the moment to be calm and be still and recognize that nothing happens unless you do. Okay. And we're going to move into the lightning round, which is fun facts. And I'm going to ask you a series of questions that I want you to give me very quick answers. Are you ready for the lightning round? I am ready for the lightning round. David, the last movie you saw? Kubo. (laughs) You relaxed doing what? Uh, Watching reviews of technology and laptops and phones. Your favorite singer? Jack Johnson. Your favorite dance song? Oh my gosh. Anything with a good beat. What food you eat every week, no matter what? I have a green smoothie, and then I have a soft spot for noodles. Asian noodle soup, actually, is what I have at least once a week. And your favorite month? My favorite month would have to be uh, September. Okay. Well, we want to thank you so much, David, for your time and for joining us on Black Entrepreneur Experience. Can you share with the audience the best way for them to connect with you? So the best way to connect with me is they can reach me uh, on my website. That's jsycoaching.com. They can also email me at dyoung at jsycoaching.com. And I'm usually there. They can also find me on Twitter. But my website, my email is the best way to reach me. David, I want to thank you so much for your time and really inspiring our audience to be the best version of them. And we are just deeply honored that you would spend time with Black Entrepreneur Experience. Thank you so much. I love being on the call. Thank you. Thank you for listening and subscribing to Black Entrepreneur Experience. We would love for you to leave a review and rating on iTunes and share with your friends. For show notes and more episodes, go to www.beepodcast.com. Join us next Wednesday. And remember, green is the new black. So keep your bank accounts and your business in the black.